almost girlish in their sort of thrill. It's as if she's exhilarated. Perhaps for the first time in her life, she was really exploring her own potential. She was completely free. She, she was she who was making the decisions. Nobody else could sort of order her around. And she was, felt she was really doing something towards the war effort. Noor's letters were carried home by the aircraft taking agents out of France. But Baker Street weren't the only people reading the letters. The double agent Henri Derricourt was first passing them to the Gestapo in Paris. This was how Derricourt worked. He showed the Germans the mail that he was carrying, which they photographed. Included in the mail were personal letters to Noor's family. They still had no idea where she was or what she was doing. Mother, such a joy to be able to post a letter to you. I really miss you terribly, Mother. I talk to you so often in my sleep. Still, next time you see me, I will be beautifully well. And shall we celebrate? We're at the address that's right here, 4 Taffeton Street. This was the family home. This is where Noor's mother lived and the children often visited her here. Looking at these three letters written by Noor, I recognize her handwriting, sent to my grandmother. They have London stamps on, but all the dates correspond to the time when Noor was already in France. My grandmother had no idea that, in fact, her daughter was in German-occupied territory. And what's really very unsettling is the fact that these letters were more than likely read first by the SD, by the German intelligence section there, before they even reached her own mother. Nor had now been transmitting for more than 12 weeks, over twice the six-week life expectancy of a wireless operator. Against all odds, she continued to evade the Gestapo, but was on borrowed time. The bitter irony of her eventual capture was that it was an act of betrayal rather than the diligence of the German forces. So far as I can make out, the sister of one of the people with whom she was working tried to get into the circuit and was turned down and was jealous and went away and told the Gestapo because it was a reward. René Gary was paid 100,000 French francs the Gestapo would have paid considerably more for this information. Nor was sold to the Gestapo for a tenth of what the Gestapo said she was worth. Is, is that it? Yeah. This is where she was arrested? This is where she was arrested, definitely. On the first floor, I think. Up there? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So this is the last place that she lived in freedom? In freedom. And then after that she was captured. That's it. Nor was reported to have put up such a fight that the man arresting her threatened to shoot her. I can't believe we're so close to the Gestapo headquarters here. Yeah. 84 Avenue Foch is only 200 meters away from where Nor was captured. In 1943, it was the headquarters of the Gestapo in Paris. She was taken round to the Avenue Foch. She said, I must have a bath. No gentleman is going to interrupt a lady in a bath. She was out of the bathroom window in a moment. But was spotted and was talked back in before she either threw herself down to the ground and killed herself or got away. So this is where all these are captured so the agents were kept in custody for some time and then sent to camps to Germany later on and being interrogated here by Hans Kiefer, by Goetz in charge of the, uh, of the uh, wireless set operations. So this is where my Aunt Noor was kept prisoner? It's on the top floor, they may, there's the servants' rooms were used as cells. John Starr there, uh, Norman, uh, Suttil, Violet Zabo, Robert Benoit, Aunt Elm and so on so on. The Gestapo chief at Avenue Foch was a very plausible character who was called the Hans Kiefer, who knew how to win round the male agents. He knew how to sit and talk to them about Eton and the guards and Churchill and the royal family. And he, he won their confidence and he put them at their ease and then he got them to talk. 
Nor never fell for that. She, the first time she saw this man, she said, I don't trust you. And I think she said very little else to him ever. Back in London, SOE were aware of a problem, as Nor had stopped transmitting. Early in October, they were to receive a message saying that Madeleine was in hospital. Code for the fact that Nor was in danger or had been captured. But because the news came from a locally recruited agent called Sonia Olszanewski, who Baker Street did not know, Buckmaster chose to ignore it. Two weeks later, SOE once again began to pick up signals from Nor's transmitter. The message indicated that she was having problems. But observers back at the receiving station noted something odd. On this signal, Nor's all-important bluff security check was omitted. Again, Buckmaster chose to ignore the warning. In fact, it was the Germans who were using Nor's captured radio to send fake messages to SOE in the hope that London would impart important information in their replies. The Germans had a name for it, the Funkspiel, or the radio game, and Buckmaster and SOE were completely taken in. Buckmaster convinced himself that not only is Nor free and operating safely, but that she has reconstituted the entire Prosper network. Of course, it was Kiefer that had reconstituted the Prosper network. He had captured everyone, or killed them off, and put his own men in, and Buckmaster was dealing with Kiefer's Gestapo officers. But in captivity, Nor, who had fared so badly in her training, was now exasperating her captors and revealing nothing under interrogation. In a sworn statement after the war, Hans Kiefer, head of the Gestapo, said, Madeline, after her capture, showed great courage, and we got no information whatsoever out of her. I am sure that in this also, she lied to us. We could never rely on anything she said. Nor had made a second escape attempt from her cells here, onto the roof of 84 Avenue Foch. Kiefer had had enough, and at the end of November 1943, after threatening to shoot her, he ordered her removal from Paris. It would be a further six months before SOE would finally accept that Madeleine had been captured. Nor had completely disappeared. Her family had no idea of what had happened to her. May 1945. As a country celebrated the end of the Second World War, the fate of Noor and 11 other missing women agents appeared to have been forgotten. Nobody in London appeared to be particularly interested in what had happened to them. They'd gone missing, assumed dead. And that was really the end of the story, as far as all the authorities in London were concerned, except for Vera. Vera Atkins, who was Buckmaster's assistant in F section, and responsible for the women agents who SOE had sent to France, made it her personal mission to discover what had happened to Noor and the others. Her initial investigation revealed that four women had been taken from Avenue Foch by train to a German prison in the town of Karlsruhe. Could Noor be one of them? Vera then followed the trail from Karlsruhe prison of these women to find out where they went next and she established that they had been taken to a concentration camp called Natzweiler. Of the four women known to be taken to Natzweiler, three of them were easily identified. Diana Rowden had been flown into France on the same flight as Noor. The second was SOE courier André Borel, and the third woman, Vera Lee. The description of the fourth woman closely matched that of Noor. Contemporary eyewitness accounts report that on the 6th of July 1944, the women suffered an appalling end as they were given lethal injections and thrown, some of them still alive, into the ovens at the camp crematorium. Vera's conclusion after very lengthy and detailed inquiries was that Noor was one of those four who died at Natzweiler. So that was how it was left. Um, in the summer of 1946, by which time these particular investigations were concluded. But six months later, 
Nor's brother, Viliad, received a letter which would prove...